You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content. We think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view. Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite. Like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. Philosophers call someone a relative, by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. My simple response to that is this. No one holds that view. No one believes that every view is as good as every other view. Welcome to One Dime Radio. Today, I'm very, very happy to have two remarkable guests, guests that I would consider friends of mine. First, we got Dave from Theory Underground. He is the founder of Theory Underground, which um, I could one could describe as a organization that allows people from who are not from traditionally academic backgrounds to learn and study theory. I really believe in the project. I've actually published something with them in their recent publication, Underground Theory Volume 1. I have an essay featured in there, and it had, it's mostly, you know, no names like myself and others on there, and some big names, you know, like Slavoj Žižek, which has kind of helped help plug this for us. And um, the other guest we got is Michael Downs, other, also known as the uh, Dangerous Maybe, runs one of the best theory blogs on the internet out there. And I don't really know what to, how to describe Michael Downs other than real life will hunting for theory. <laughs> Seriously though, like I've learned a lot from Michael Downs, learned a lot from Dave and they, what they do on Theory Underground, they teach courses. I'm currently enrolled in one I'm on Zizek's book for They Know Not What They Do. And they're here today to discuss their upcoming course on Nick Land. Michael's gonna be teaching this class on Nick Land and that's why today's episode is on the question of accelerationism and particularly Nick Land's ver uh, version of accelerationism. And uh, I guess to get started, uh, would you guys like to introduce yourselves and then we'll get straight into why should we give a shit about Nick Land, this internet meme? Why don't you go first, Dave? Hi, everybody. Yeah, so my full name is David McCarricker. I think you nailed it already when you said that Theory Underground is for people that aren't doing the traditional academic thing, but are interested in concepts, thinkers, philosophy, theory, et cetera. And so, I mean, Mikey's kind of like our mascot, you know, so it's like he's somebody who works in a warehouse, but as soon as he gets off, he goes to the coffee shop and he works for hours on reading and writing and developing himself and his thinking. And so Theory Underground is really for people like that. Uh, but it's also for people who are in the institutions who are in academia, or maybe other institutions, but feels who might be feeling alienated, because maybe you, you you're doing this graduate school thing, or your professor or whatever, because you care about the field, and you don't like the fact that it's becoming more and more instrumentalized. You don't like that you get a lot of people in your courses who are just there for a grade, who are probably sitting there with their earbuds in. And there's the, there's all this administrative pressure to really not do the thing, which which is the thing that we all love and that we're here to do. So Theory Underground is supposed to be a space for that. It's my own platform. I built it myself. Um, it's, on, it's all built off of WordPress. There's an app. You can get it on the iOS store or on Android. And We've been compared to other things. We're not like anything else, right? Like Theory Underground is its own thing. It's a, te it's a teaching lecture course platform, like you've said, but it's also a publishing house. And so then people compare it to other publishing people or compare it to other YouTubers or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's a teaching platform owned and operated by me. And then I bring on friends and fellow travelers to do stuff that we're interested in doing together. And it's ultimately to model what's possible with these means at our disposal, right? Ivan Illich in his book, Deschooling Society, talks about the idea of learning webs. And so that, that would be where educators have the freedom to really just do what they want and people can connect with them and there will just be webs of learning communities. 
you know, and there's all kinds of ways that that could be funded, all kinds of ways that you could do some kind of a social credit system to make that work. But for right now, we're just pioneering what's possible with these media at our disposal. And we just finished a tour. I was on a tour with Nance and Ann, and we met you in Ontario. Um, we met a lot of people. We went to the McLuhan Institute. We met up with Catrone, Daniel Tut, Doug Lane. You know, so a lot of the people kind of from the left part of the internet, especially the left theory part of the internet. But really, this is not just for leftists. It's really for theory, for ideas, for understanding. And it's supposed to be a lot more academic than purely propagandistic, which, you know, matters. But there's there needs to be spaces for, for thinking and questioning. And challenging ourselves. And I think that's the segue there to Mikey, because that's ultimately what we're doing here with this course on Nick Lamb. Yeah. So I'm Michael Downs, I'm the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog on Medium. And for the last, I don't know, four years now, I think, the blog has been focused on primarily taking complicated concepts from especially continental philosophy and trying to explain them in such a way that makes them accessible and uh, get some concrete orientation with them, right? So for me, I'm primarily uh, coming out of the Lacanian, Zizekian uh, school of thought, right? I'm, I'm no bones about it. I'm some kind of Lacanian, Zizekian. Uh, but Baudrillard's had a huge influence on me. Deleuze and Guattari, Marx, I mean, Heidegger. And so the blog, I mean, you'll find posts on all of those various thinkers. And so that, that's what it's been about. One level, I'm trying to make the stuff intelligible for a broad audience to the best of my ability on the other this is also my way of learning right like if I, if I have to break this stuff down I feel like if I can't teach it to somebody I don't really know it myself and so on the one hand it, it's pedagogical but it's also self-pedagogical for me and so that's that's been the approach I'm currently writing three books one of which is the main book I've been working on for four years now something like that and I'm really hoping to have it done within the next year. But yeah, and while I'm doing this, I'm teaching at the Air Underground. The first course was on GGX4, They Know Not What They Do. And now we're doing an intro to Nick Land. And so the question is why, right? Because I'm certainly not a rightist. The reason is because accelerationism has had a huge influence on contemporary political theory. And Nick Land is this guy. Yes, he's now a neo-reactionary. I think a lot of a lot of your listeners probably know that. But he was also really the founder of this theory collective called the CCRU, Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, which was stationed at Warwick University throughout the 90s. And this theory collective had a lot of important thinkers in it who were at the time they were kind of Land's disciples, but Mark Fisher was there. Reza Negarastani, um, Sadie Plant helped found it with Nick Land, but Anna Greenspan, uh, Luciana Parisi, a lot of these important thinkers were part of this. And so this, and then you have these other thinkers who were closely related to it, which is like Ray Brassier. And um, so, so a lot of people were connected to the CCRU in various ways and had an immense influence. And the whole speculative realist movement primarily comprised of Graham Harmon, Quentin Mayasu, Ray Brassier, and Ian Hamilton Grant. Grant was also a member of the CCRU. This whole thing, this return to trying to engage with objects in and of themselves, that influence comes directly from land. So his main collection of works is called Fang Numina. And Numina, of course, is the Kantian term for things in themselves. And so land is really this this key influence on accelerationist politics whether it be in its left or right form or its other forms and also the speculative realist movement so if somebody wants to really engage with the work of Reza Negarassani or Mark Fisher or Ian Hamilton Grant or any of that it's essential to understand what land was up to especially in the 90s and it, it's kind of like if you want to understand what Derrida was doing if you want to understand what Levinas was up to you got to know some Heidegger right and so part of the course is just laying this theoretical foundation that land established for both accelerationist politics and for speculative realism and on top of that the other thing is who land is now is this neo-reactionary 
figure, the, the one of the founders of the neo-reactionary movement. One, it's important to understand what this movement actually is, because simply just saying, oh, it's neo-fascist or it's alt-right, a lot of the nuances, this specific position are lost if we just throw a term on it and then brush it under the rug, right? So I think it's important to understand the actual You're position. You're platforming fascism. Say what? You're platforming fascism. Didn't you know that? But the, the funny thing, it's not fascist. It, yeah, it, <laughs> I'm saying it's going have its issues. But when you get into the details of it, like Land's always been an anti-fascist. Like his philosophy at its core goes against the, the key principles of fascism, even though it's hyper capitalistic. And so that's this, this issue here is trying to understand the specific dynamics and, and positions of Land's particular form of neo-reaction. I mean, it's closely related to Mencius Mulbug, aka Curtis Yarvin. Uh, but yeah, here's why it's important is because when you look at what Land and Yarvin want out of their neo-reactionary politics, it was basically, it's like Steve Bannon read them and then applied it to the whole the whole Trump phenomenon. D develop anti-cathedral, which is to say anti-mainstream or anti-liberal forms of media, creates by Breitbart. You want a type of hyper-capitalist corporate ruler or monarch, you get Trump, who, one that's incredibly charismatic. You want that figure to undermine democracy uh, as much as possible. You, you look at the playbook and Bannon implemented it. And so wherever we see this type of thing going on, it's important to understand the theoretical basis for it was. And uh, that's why I think it's just important to understand who Nick Land is, what his philosophy is all about, and how it is continuing to influence the world we live in. And my hunch is that it's going to continue to influence it. And I think Land's, he's just going to grow in lore. And that's part of what we want to do in some sense is demystify this guy because so many people treat him. We keep saying this when we have this conversation, but so many people want to refer to him as he who shall not be named. And the second you prohibit even talking about somebody, you give them power. I mean, it's funny, but it's the Voldemort thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of it is like, no, the, the guy is a British philosopher who fought his way to a unique position. That's true. And because it's hyper-capitalist, anti-fascist, and yet also pessimistic, deeply pessimistic from anybody else's perspective except Land's, you get a very unique philosophical system. And again, I think it's important to see the logic at work in it to understand what the appeal is to a lot of a lot of people on the right. And for them to also understand that if they are any way, shape, or form rightists or conservatives, this is absolutely at odds with what any typical conservative or typical traditionalist or rightist would actually want out of a politics. And so that's kind of long story short. Right. I do want to address that question with regard to covering Nick Land because, you know, you're doing a course. We're talking about it on this podcast. And of course, inevitably, some people will be like, why platform reactionaries? And also that's, my, that's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. And also why read reactionaries? And right. I think mm, there's this assumption that if you're reading a thinker, that you there's a risk that you will spread those ideas, those dangerous ideas, which will pollute their mind, will corrupt their soul or whatnot. And I think uh, with that mentality, some, someone who comes in with that mentality is is pretty mentally weak. I mean, if you're afraid that this this idea is going to disrupt your whole ideology, then your grounding isn't very strong to begin with, because this course isn't being taught by people who are propagating the like Nick Landian ideology. That would be a different question, right? If we got Mencius Moldbug to do the course, it might be, that'd be a very different question, right? Because that's an agenda that's, that's a bias where it's kind of studying this from a standpoint of social science is, is very different. Actually trying to understand this and what the phenomenon is. Now, what's still not very clear to me, and I'm sure we'll get into this increasingly, is um, I'm always up to study right-wing thinkers. For example, a big thinker that I read a lot of is Leo Strauss, and, and you know he's, he's associated with neoconservatism. Uh, however, I am still not fully convinced, and perhaps you'll, you'll convince me, as to what is super valuable in Nick Land and what can he teach us about, I guess, society today. And what does this theory bring to the table uh, in general? Uh, and I guess maybe before you get into that, I'll let Dave... Uh, 
say what he wanted to say about, I think, platforming Nick Land. Yeah, because that's my first thing. And then my second thing sets him up to basically respond to your question, your, that follow-up question. So the platforming thing, I just wanted to say, I have really strongly mixed feelings about the assumptions and arguments that go into these calls to deplatform people. Because I think in a lot of cases, it actually adds a lot of mysteriousness or dark, ooh, this person's like they're untouchable and ooh, maybe maybe they're right because we know the establishment is fucked and so if the establishment won't let them talk then maybe they're onto something and so lends them this sort of import that in a lot of cases they don't really deserve um and in a lot of cases if they were speaking it was in a forum where people could counter them as long as the people that as long as those people were competent they'd probably look like fools but uh, we don't have very many competent moderators or forums for that kind of discourse. So I understand that there's a lot of complexity in the issue because also there are a lot of mentally weak people on the internet. And so even if we're so above it, having like this sort of contagion effect on us, well, then what about other people, right? And well, then, I mean, I kind of think, well, they're going to they're gonna find it anyway. You know, they're going to find it, but they're going to find it from somebody else, first of all. Uh, but more importantly, I think that even if we say, yeah, ideas spread like viruses. And so if there's like bad ideas, we just want to make sure that those aren't being spread. If we agreed with that, which I don't, but if we did agree with it, there's a big difference between a, like a news outlet and an educational space. Like that's, that's the main thing. So people are thinking of propaganda wars and the Overton window in mainstream media where someone's like, oh, well, let's get both sides. Let's bring Richard Spencer on or whatever. And it's like, well, or Fuentes, I guess, is a more contemporary example, but that's that's not the same thing as like, a, hey, you want to be a competent thinker in the realm of political philosophy? That requires thinking dialectically. That means moving through different positions. And you got to find, because you only have, you have limited time and energy, you got to, you got to have a, you got to invest that wisely, right? So you've really got to choose your thinkers that you focus on. And so you got to, if you're trying to do this dialectical thing, you got to think, okay, well, what are the main things that I want to work through to really kind of get a grasp on the subject matter that I'm thinking about? And so the subject matter that we're thinking about in this case is not just, oh, a bunch of sexy or cool kids or, or like hipster kids or whatever, who are like listening to jungle music and and doing and experimenting with drugs while reading Deleuze and Guattari and like hanging out with Nick Land, which I mean, that's that kind is of like what the CCRU was, wasn't it? Yes, yes, like the University yeah. of Warwick, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is what it was, but it's not just oh, it had an impact on speculative realism and object oriented ontology. And you know, no, it's it's also um thinking about the future and bringing that into philosophy in a really serious way, and but also. Because the people, especially in, in the theory scene in academia today, because they're so careful and usually like they don't want to take strong positions, things are very clarifying. Even when the person takes a wrong position, if they do take a really strong position, I'm basically just trying to say that Land is someone who ends up taking a strong position. And it's not just a position in the field of critical theory or of post-Marxism or whatever. It's actually... A position on the future itself and philosophy and theory don't tend to really get into the future per se and so the way that ccru developed and really incorporated science fiction um, and then the way that land takes his position i think that's what's so clarifying and so mikey to, to, to bring it back to the question he'd asked you i want to make sure you touch on that thing that zizek says about ayn rand because i just think that's kind of a perfect it kind yeah, of gets to the point. Part of it is so Zizek has this great. Whenever you bring up Ayn Rand with leftists, uh, obviously there's a great dismissal of her, uh, and Zizek actually has a certain appreciation for Ayn Rand. There's a very specific perspective from which he's seeing this. He thinks that Ayn Rand ultimately did the left a favor because Rand basically was so masked off about the selfishness and all of that that goes into capitalism that Zizek thinks about it, like a lot of people who would read Ayn Rand would actually find it the motivation to critique capitalism. Like, my God, if this lady's right, capitalism really sucks. And 
so he he views Ayn Rand as inadvertently writing anti-capitalist theory, even though she thinks it's pro-capitalist, right? That's kind of how we view Nick Land in a lot of ways, that when you understand Land's theory of capitalism is and where he believes it's going, to anybody except alt-right edgelords, and I don't think they would even, they don't, I don't think they really go, they just like using it as memes, meme fodder. Uh, when you find out what his position actually is, it actually deters people away from capitalism and uh, against his his wishes. But it's funny when you when you start getting into it, you're like, do you think you're going to win anybody over here? So so this is so people don't know. So what 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 is the unjust short broad stroke version of what it is that land ultimately stands for? OK, so here 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 it is in a nutshell. Land thinks that capital accumulation coming out of Marx, right? We know capital is defined as a formula, MCM prime. Money is invested in commodity production. Commodity production and distribution leads to the sale of the commodity at the end of which you get surplus value or a, a profit, right? So this economic procedure for land is also the great agent of technological development because capitalists want to technologically renovate and innovate the production process so as to make it more efficient, which means they get the upper hand in the market, so on and so forth. So technological development is actually spurred on by the, the, the process of capital accumulation. Land thinks this process from its very inception is virtually geared towards the emergence of artificial intelligence because the logic of capital is to make things as intelligently efficient as possible. Well, if that's the case, then artificial intelligence, intelligence that's far more intelligent than ours, is this kind of virtual potential operating within capitalism. He thinks that the very logic of capital is geared towards artificial intelligence, and he goes so far as to make the, the bold claim, capitalism is artificial intelligence. Now for him, this is where he gets into the theory fiction stuff, but he ultimately thinks that this artificial intelligence is going to be the techno-capital singularity or a type of super intelligence. He likens it to Lovecraftian deities like Cthulhu. And he thinks that the whole process of capitalism is geared towards the emergence of the singularity, which when it arises is going to bring about human extinction. This he affirms with a kind of Nietzschean joy or Bataillean delight in death. And so he's for capitalism because it will produce an intelligence that's far greater than ours, which is for him, it's a far greater philosopher than any of us could ever be. And so for the sake of philosophy or critique, the point is to accelerate this process to the point of the emergence of the singularity, which will inevitably wipe us out and bring about human extinction. I don't, what you're not touching on is, is how he brings in outside of all the sci-fi elements this sort of Lovecraftian uh, occult um, uh, chaos magic element mm -hmm. with all this numerology shit. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Do you think that there's anything of value in all the the, the cons, the conceptual equipment itself? Well, yeah. I, I think this concept of hyperstition that the super the CCRU developed is really important. Um, as you know, Dave, I'm writing something right now that connects it to Zizek's theory of belief, because I think there's some big overlap here. So hyperstition for the CCRU are, um, it's a category of fictions that make themselves real. Now, to you, Tony, you're probably hearing a little bit of Baudrillard in there. Like, wait, 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 is there a Baudrillard, a Baudrillardian component? Well, not really, because... Land ultimately thinks that artificial intelligence will actually operate according to the reality principle far, far greater than humans ever were able to. So reality doesn't implode for land or for the CCRU the way it does for Baudrillard. In fact, with the techno capital singularity or super intelligence or AI, reality is actually going to be refined. And that's what he actually sees at the heart of blockchain or Bitcoin is that you have an algorithmic system that, though, as far as Land sees it, is more or less fail proof when it comes to determining authentic transactions 
from inauthentic transactions, which is to say a fail-proof reality principle, right? And it would be very interesting to see Baudrillard and Land have a debate over this, this thing. But for Land, what he does grant is that fictions do become real. There is a threshold. And for him, sci-fi is this kind of praxis that tends to actualize things that are it depicts at once it's fictional but in the future they have so much weight to them it's like they actualize themselves and so you look at uh the, one of the great influences on him william gibson and his uh his novel uh neuromancer so much i mean gibson comes up with this term cyberspace and describes this kind of uh this internet before there was the internet as we know it right and so sci-fi writers are able to envision these future realities that plant the seed uh, of of imagination creativity in engineers and people working in technology and if they catch on this is the cybernetic aspect if they, if they catch on if they take on material traction in the world these fictions can actually come about as realities. And so that's what Land is trying to do with all of his various hyperstitional praxises, is he's trying to enable or accelerate the actuality of the techno-capital singularity. And so he, he he's... He, but the thing is, there's all these other ways that... I mean, you can think about how leftists have used this idea of a communist society as a type of hyperstition that that vision of the future uh, has organized actual or you know concrete political organizations and th their material praxis is geared towards trying to realize this hyperstitional future and so he's not the first one to do this but he's the first one to really theor well I should say the CCRU are the first ones to really theorize in a in a detailed philosophical way how fictions can actually have more ontological weight so to speak than the actually existing state of affairs that would be a baudrillardian thing actually right there about fiction being uh having more weight potentially like a fiction illusion yeah but it's the it's the reality principle this ability to sharply and accurately discern what's real from what's not that's what implodes for Baudrillard yeah. eventually, uh, or well, even now. Well, for Land, that distinction only gets refined and more, more distinct um, as AI grows. And so instead of reality imploding, he thinks that the reality principle is going to only take hold in the future. Yeah, so this is where I have some kind of critical questions about sure. my impression. <laughs> yeah, so... Okay, so the my my thing with Nick Land is not so much um, you know about right wing zealotry or whatever. My more critiques are this sort of assumption that because you at least said it right that he thinks capitalism is almost uses it synonymously with AI that capitalism uh, produces an advancement in of artificial intelligence. That is something that I used to also believe, and I actually think it, it's not. Uh, that this is the thing people associate most with accelerationism, right? This technological development, this uh, cyber uh, utopia or dystopia, depending how you look at it, um, mm -hmm. that's kind of a product of accelerating capitalism. I, I think that dates in Marx himself, because in many ways, Marx, I think, was very overly optimistic about capitalism, right? And the productive forces being a precursor to uh, communism. Uh, the thing is, though, is I, and you can see that optimism a little bit reflected in one of my older videos, Planet of the Robots, which is sort of a, has that AI optimism of sorts. But over, I kind of think, though, that the rate at which capitalism itself um, advances AI is very much exaggerated, and for a couple of reasons. One, because um, the times we've seen the most technological innovation, most at least automation, was was actually in the periods where the state state intervention was at its highest. So like in the 60s, for example, it was like a major, from 60s to 70s, major huge advancements. And even like things like uh, DARPAnet or the internet, it was a mixture of state and, and capital working together 
Um, and I'm not saying Nick Land isn't aware of this because he clearly is, because in Dark Enlightenment, I notice a shift because he's almost more pessimistic about capitalism and thinks that the problem, though, isn't capitalism, it's democracy. So yeah. that's why he likes China so much. He thinks, um, you know, the reason why their capitalism is so good is because the state's able to just, you know, um, accelerate the productive forces. But that kind of begs the question, though, is it really capitalism that is this pioneer of artificial that itself leads to this technological innovation, or is it really like markets and the state kind of providing the startup capital and picking and choosing winners um, rather than so much like democracy being a hindrance on this process? Is it perhaps just what the reason why um, technological innovation wasn't as fast as he thought it was in the 90s, mainly just due to the fact that there wasn't this robust state intervention that you have in the likes of China? Because uh, in many ways, China is more hyper-capitalist, but it's it's less free market, sure, like surely less free market. In other words, it's not capitalism on, on its own terms that is leading to this AI innovation. It seems to be really the state and kind of state market activity. Exactly. What would be your response to that or how you think about that or how land that fits into land's philosophy? Because I, I see that... I maybe I'm wrong, but I see it as a sort of. It it feels like um, his political economy is off. That's that's my impression. Well, then, yeah, he he would. I mean, we just yesterday we did a line by line reading of one of his uh, influential blog posts, little essays uh, called "A Quick and Dirty Introduction to Accelerationism," and in it he cites Mark uh, Marx on uh, free trade and how Marx talking about you know the creative destruction essentially and that um capitalism is this this agent of change right um and that that's definitely there in marx uh dave you want to say something you could see i was but then i was holding myself back but yeah i it's that section from what the speech he gave in uh at least one of the speeches he gave in 1848 uh in defense of free trade and he's talking about how uh, these, this, this, the the anti free trade position helps maintain the stability and integrity of these old powers, and that free trade destabilizes those and and ultimately destroys these these national boundaries, borders, identities, right? And so mm-hmm. um, this is how lands tying. I could probably pull it up. I've I don't got have it right handy. Here. I've got okay. it. Yeah, Mark cool. says, yeah, it's uh, in an 1848 speech on the question of free trade. Mark says, in general, the protective system of our day is conservative. While the free trade system is destructive, it breaks up old nationalities and pushes the antagonism of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie to the extreme point. In a word, the free trade system hastens the social revolution. It is in this revolutionary sense alone, gentlemen, that I vote in favor of free trade. Yeah, this is what I meant by Marx being like overly optimistic about capitalism because, um, yeah, like I think accelerationism, this idea, it's more underlying premise is from Marx himself as as Land acknowledges, right? And in the accelerationist reader, they include... um, that essay on from Grundrisse, the uh, fragment on machines, a, f- a fragment of machines, and uh, this is what I I can't help but think though that um, I'm not sure if that aged super well in terms of is capitalism really this innovative? Is it really that um, I guess you could say accelerative for lack of a better term? I think and, uh, that response would simply be look at the equipment you're talking on, which is to say like. And this is his upper hand against left accelerationists like Alex Williams and Nick Cernicek, where he can say, look, the technology we have was absolutely unthinkable to people 500 years ago. And it's also completely inseparable from the process of capital accumulation. Yeah, maybe it's not going to happen as quickly as I I, I optimistically thought in the 90s. Um, Part of his his lull or his his period of depression with the rise of Facebook and the election of Obama and all that stuff around 2008 
was he realized that what he calls the human security system, which he that's this is this key element of the CCRU reader, um, which is just basically democracy or states. There's there's different ways. Fascism would be part of it for him. Um, it's it's human. It's the human attempt at the basically the state level to ward off the capitalist apocalypse, which is to say. We don't want capitalism to go crazy, go off the rails uh, with, with its accelerating change. We want to maintain a certain status quo in society while also piggybacking on the deterritorializing dimension of capitalism, which is to say its potential for radical change and, and development. So Land wants to abolish or, or fight against the human security system, and this was the CCRU's position in the 90s. They called themselves the K insurgency or cyber insurgency because that's what their praxis was supposed to do was help accelerate capital against the state apparatus. And um, but but that's the thing that Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams in a book that's had a lot of influence on me, Inventing the Future. This is uh, their, their version of left accelerationism. And the key position there is they, they believe that it's possible, and this is something we see in socialism too, is that it's the idea that real hyper technological productivity actually comes from freeing technological development from capitalist social relations from capital, right? And um, this was the, the, the Marxist uh, communist vision of things, which if we can go to a collectivized economy, then we unleash the forces of production to uh, take on new potentials that they are hindered uh, from, from exploring in capitalism. But land would just simply go, yeah, but I've got history on my side, which is to say, anytime we have radical technical technological development, I don't care if it's in our communication system or whatever, uh, medicine, it's thanks to this logic of capital accumulation in the market that's driving it. And prior to the emergence of capital being the organizing principle of society, MCU or MCM prime, yes, humans made certain te technological development, sure, but it's not at the rate at which we see it now under capitalism. And so even if it's, you know, land says in meltdown, uh, nothing human makes it out of the near future. Okay, well, how near is the near future? Right? If, if he was talking 20 years, then he was he proved himself wrong. But if we say 200 years from now, then who knows, right? But that that's just the way he sees it is that the very logic of capital accumulation based on the technological development and refinement of the means of production themselves entails this I, this this germ form of artificial intelligence because the the point of the economy i mean it, he doesn't talk like this but i think it's helpful to view it this way we go back to adam smith and we think about this thing he called the invisible hand imagine the invisible hand of the market but actually self aware right and this kind of virtual trans individual intelligence called the invisible hand. Um, you could say that this is the, the larval form of the techno capital singularity, which is it emerges out of the, the, the capitalist desire to have greater efficiency in the market. And then it, of course it inadvertently go, it goes against their wills and their wishes as concrete human beings. Um, and takes on a life of its own. But that would be basically the uh, the apocalypse for him is when that happens. So yeah, I have two questions in response to that. And um, so with what is it Nick Land exactly trying to accelerate by accelerating capitalism? Is it automation or is it the destruction of capitalism? Because I think there's a lot of confusion uh, with regard to that because um, if we're talking about accelerating automation i it is very unclear it's very un, i'm very unconvinced that um freeing the market from the state would lead to more automation because we see the opposite of that with uh china right china's you know had some of some very robust technological innovation a lot of the stuff that elon musk talks about doing like for example the self-driving cars china's already doing with its company baidu um which you know it is 
there's no there's not the separation between the state and the market there's a huge um a collusion a partnership between them and uh so with if we, and also if we're trying to accelerate automation would that knowing what we're how what we're accelerating with accelerationism i think is crucial because it really de determines what we're what an accelerationist practice is so you know there are a lot of people think accelerationism would be voting for the more aggressive capitalist candidate, let's say Republicans like Trump. But I would think, for example, if you uh, what gives uh, work, what gives bosses more of an incentive to automate labor, it's not uh, lower wages, it's higher wages. So that's the whole paradox. If you have high unionization, there's a higher cost of labor, then there's an incentive to, um, you know, to out to automate increasingly. But if you're if you can pay uh, something like global free trade, I actually don't think it was necessarily great for uh, for for automation for for a lot of reasons. One, there's intellectual property restrictions, and the second thing is why would you need to invest in robotics when you can hire someone in Philippines to you know or or just bring your factory to Bangladesh or something like that? So if for this is why it's Cernicek and Williams, they I think they said UBI is a, is accelerationist. And uh, they see like in this, a certain kind of social democracy as accelerationist, and I guess their version is, is automation. But is that is Land's uh, version of accelerationism automation, or the destruction of capitalism, or both those things? And if so, how does he plan to accelerate those things? I wanna I wanna just say one thing before letting Mikey kind of address the thing on China, because uh, he knows a lot more about land and his um love affair with china or but i think the the big issue here is the way you're phrasing it makes it sound like we have some kind of ability to do something some kind of ability to make decisions and actually affect things and I think that, you know, we can definitely say we do, we do, we have agency, we have the ability to change things, but to really sit with the right accelerationist pro, uh, uh, pill, like I'm not saying take the pill, but I'm saying to really think it through, we don't have any ability to do anything. The, the information action ratio is so off at this point, all we have is information uh, and no real way to get out ahead of it and no real way to control anything. It's it's just going. He's not being prescriptive. He's not saying, oh, we should do things that will make this happen. He's just coming along to say, hey, guys, you know, all those things that you're doing and all that stuff you're talking about, about like like you're sitting around actually controlling the economy or like you actually have some kind of a future or, or you know, there's someone at the steering wheel. There's not like that's ultimately what he's doing but he thinks that there are I'm not convinced about that though because in well, the in no, the, no, and the oh, essay hold on, hold yeah. on. none of us are none, none of us are convinced about this but no i mean that that not the thesis but that's he doesn't think there's nothing to do because in that critique of mark the transcendental miserabilism which you guys were talking about mm -hmm. uh, on theory underground which i was listening to i mean he seems like going the way through capitalism is to go through it and that implies a sort of action a sort of praxis so i mean I, obviously I, he doesn't believe in revolution but what what does one do to accelerate something more or less and, and that's I think, and that's where we bring china in so that's actually his answer so but here's the thing here how he views it is all we can do we can't actually stop the storm on the horizon what we can do is try to delay it and we can delay it through remnants of Keynesian economics, social welfare state, um, democracy, human rights, we can we can delay it, but it's going to happen. And the point is, if you could take almost like a God's eye perspective on the planet, and you could see, like even a, you imagine like looking down on a city from up above, and you see all the cars moving and all this, there's a kind of trans individual will or uh, intelligence operating that no one person knows all of the moving parts there this process is so beyond um one person's ability or even a group of individuals ability to process all of it 
And this cybernetic feedback process is what's running the show. And the end trajectory, of course, you can argue, well, okay, he thinks the ultimate T loss is the, the super intelligent. Okay. Um, <laughs> obviously, somebody can argue against that. Um, I guess the takeaway is, yeah, but do we feel like if whatever this process is, if it does continue to do what it's doing, I think we all know that it ends catastrophically, at least for us, right? And that's, but that's what he has in mind is that this process is the revolutionary agent. No human, no group of humans, no particular class. This cycle, this circuit of capital accumulation is the, the, the great agent of critique, of technological development, etc. And for him, so yeah, there's, there's two ways you can say. On, on the one hand, he said you can't do anything. You can't do anything to stop what's inevitable, at least from his perspective, which is human extinction, right? He thinks that's inevitable. Now, in some deeper philosophical sense, I don't think we, I mean, most of us would agree, yeah, we, we as a species probably aren't going to exist forever. But when he says human extinction, he has something more precise in mind that's uh, looming for us in the near future. What he does think can be done, which is a kind of his hyperstition, I mean, hyperstition is a kind of praxis for him and the CCRU. It's trying to, instead of delay the inevitable, it's trying to move towards the inevitable. So what does acceleration want to accelerate? The process of capital accumulation, technological development, et cetera, which inevitably leads to the emergence of the singularity with which wipes, wipes us all out. And so th this process is what he wants to accelerate. And for him, he says acceleration accelerationism is whatever the process needs it to be, which is to say the criterion that determines what counts as an accelerationist praxis is whatever facilitates this capitalistic technological process. So when we get to the dark enlightenment stuff, his thinking has turned to, because he's influenced by Mencius Moldbug, what he ultimately wants is authoritarian capitalism. He wants what we think of as democracies, the democratic states, to be replaced by mega corporations. And when I say mega corp, like, okay, I live in Missouri. He, he loves the idea of a corporation owning all of Missouri. And I, so I would not only work in Missouri, I would live in the place I work, right? The whole place would be owned as a corporation and atop it would be a capitalistic monarch. So he wants the return of a monarch. Um, this is the whole Trump Trump as a proto-capitalist monarch thing, right? He wants a capitalist monarch because it does away with all of the checks and balances, bureaucratic hindrances that gets in the way from capital just being able to flow. So for him, he actually thinks a, a capitalistic state in the sense of the way we're talking here, a, he calls it a patchwork of these, right? That if you had a, basically a capitalist king that could just make the decision like the capitalists and the board of directors do at corporations, you cut through all the democratic shit and capital can just do what it wants without any democratic bureaucratic hindrances. And you basically, this friction between capital in the state is undermined for him in this way. Sure, there's a million different ways to object to that, but that process is ultimately where he's landed on what he thinks will most effectively facilitate the emergence of the techno-capital singularity. And so the thing with China is that he thinks that the, the authoritarian, the, the whole thing, Zizek talked about this whole thing, like what if authoritarian capitalism actually turns out to be more efficiently capitalistic than liberal democratic capitalism has been. And so Slavoj has already thought this kind of thing through. But for Land, that's why he's all about Shanghai. He thinks that Shanghai in particular is going to be the place that the singularity emerges or it, it has the most potential for it. And not like tucked away in a lab, like with Skynet and the Terminator movies, he thinks that the whole, it's a, it's a vision of the whole city of Shanghai being connected, 
in such a way as the whole thing becomes an artificial intelligence system and that the whole city is the singularity eventually. I mean, it's, it's this image that he plays with um, in, in all the stuff he, he, he does with China. So I, I see a lot of different things almost going on with that theory that are actually seem to me at odds with each other, because on one hand, you're talking about this accelerationism of the acceleration of human extinction and the inevitable, right? In many ways, that's actually parallels what a lot of Marxists today still say. Like, I don't know if you take Ted Reese, for example, he'll say the same thing, except, you know, it's, it's Mar Nick Lenz vision is Marxism without the proletariat, Marxism without the proletariat and without communism. Or without um, human but, emancipation. He doesn't care about us. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the thing about, I see two different things with that vision of the sort of corporate monarch and China as an example. It's almost actually very opposite because with China, you kind of have a um, reassertion, almost like a Bonapartist type regime where it's, there's, the state has a relative autonomy from capitalism and it'll, it'll discipline capital to such an extent where it actually does, it goes against the short-term interests of many capitalists. Like for example, um, uh, China frequently does, does not give a shit about its stock market investors. I found that something very fascinating about how a lot of people like China, you'd think like such a robust economy, right? Um, a lot of people were, I saw on Wall Street Journal and all these like investment, this is where I, I go and I want to like understand what the capitalist state of capitalism is. I go to the, those high priests, right? You know, Wall Street Journal, all of them. And they always say, you know, China is terrible to invest in because you know, they don't care if they don't care if a stock goes up or down. It's all about this party's priorities. And to me, that seems a lot like um, the type of capitalism in which the state has a strong relative autonomy, kind of like you know, when Putin came to power after Yeltsin, right? He uh, actually like, he uh, nationalized some of the oil and media companies and put oligarchs in jail, but kept capitalism going. It's to stabilize it. Whereas the kind of, um, and the, the kind of capitalism which involves a state disciplining it seems to be the type of capitalism that leads to more innovation, more um, automation, which seems to me like that's the singularity, right? But this sort of free market deregulatory capitalism in which the head of state is literally a one of the richest capitalists seems to me not something that would speed up the singularity, but would rather just kind of lead to a sort of corporate anarchy, which is uh, leads to less automation. And so is, this is what I mean is like, I think the process of human extinction is sped up by having a corporate monarch, but not the singularity, not the technological Criswellian uh, vision of innovation. Um, so that's what I mean. It's like, it seems to be like a contradiction. I don't know. Or, I mean, I think for him, I mean, he wouldn't say yeah, that. It's not, a, it's not a critique of you, obviously. You're no, a no, neutral I, presenter he, of this, but saying, like this theory. Yeah. I think what he likes about China is, okay, you can go into those types of details and obviously offer all kinds of critiques, but what he appreciates, he, he appreciates non-democratic capitalism. Because he he doesn't want it. He doesn't care about the public's will or wishes or their well-being. What he thinks is that if if we enacted this type of, I mean, it's called neocameralism, right? Uh, if we enacted this type of patchwork capitalist monarchy, um, what you get, he, he thinks in the short term, it would make things better for people. You have greater security. You don't have to worry about voting. You don't have to worry about the 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 political situation you work and you live your life and that's it but you don't participate in the government you don't participate in elections anything like that and um yeah but you can get into all kinds of i mean obviously this is not uh, a position that vast majority of human beings are going to go for this idea that we live breathe and eat inside of capitalism but and this is the mole bug thing right mole bug thinks you we this is a political revolution that could actually be pulled off because it already is the case that corporations ultimately run the world states are there to service them in various ways and that simply switching to making the the corporations have absolute authority and control is just a change a change at the formal level that because they already have this control over all of us and again, I think you can argue. But isn't China like the opposite of that? The exact opposite of that? I mean, the CEO of Alibaba literally goes missing when he criticizes the party. 
but the point the is richest guy in china, china just, is that just, they're, they're they're not saying china is that they're not saying oh they've achieved what we the, want the point is that the entire state apparatus is behind long-term development of ai and putting everything towards that as opposed to allowing capitalists to do what they want yeah so 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 fucking over capitalists and making them remember that they work for the state or that they actually need to keep their interests within the 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 horizon of what the state actually wants works for land that's why he moved there it's like he's very into the way that they're treating their capitalists because capitalism is not what he's talking about he's talking about capital he doesn't he doesn't care about capitalists either that makes sense in terms of the standpoint of singularity and innovation and uh, all that, but it just seems what I'm mainly just pointing out, it seems completely at odds with the whole corporate monarch because with the corporate monarch, you have a, like less relative autonomy of the state and capital. And for capitalism to really work efficiently in the long term requires this relative autonomy, which is why, you know, Marx wrote so much about Bonapartism in the 18th Brumaire because he was, you know, pretty fascinated by the fact that you had a, uh, had a, a sort of like in a decline of democracy and a imposition of state authority, but to, you know, put the system in check, but for its own long-term interests, right? And in the case of, you know, if you're just thinking of the long-term interests of capitalism, capital accumulation, that sort of strong state in which it's a little bit almost, it's autonomous from the capitalists, it p imposes discipline on them. That would make sense. But the corporate monarch, the Trumpism, it just seems the, the opposite of that, which is why is it that corporate monarch part of Land's vision or is that Moldbug's vision? Because if so, Land's vision with Chinese neo-capitalism and Moldbug's corporate monarch seem kind of diametrically at odds with each other. That's yeah, what I'm trying got, to point he's, out. He's taken elements from these different situations and trying to, all he cares about is servicing capital. Capital is his God. And so whatever serves the process that is what accelerationism is for him though when it comes to this this monarch thing is you got to remember the the ruler of a, a capitalist state which is i'm just going to call it that for so we keep keep in mind what we've got here so if, if if missouri was a corporation the point is the the people who work or and and live in the missouri corporation um they can move to other ones. And so part of what each capitalist monarch would be having to do is compete against the other capitalist monarchs. And so part of that would be how, how good can I make my society so I get the vast majority of labor or, or workers to come to my capitalist state, right? And so it's he's relying on good old fashioned capitalist competition here between the monarchs for the, for who who wants to the, the idea is that if you have the freedom to choose where you live then you want to try to live in the best capitalist state possible so the capitalist monarch has to make that state as good as it possibly can be to attract essentially consumers right and of course you get into this whole agamben territory which is what if you're the type of person that you don't want to be in this one but you don't want to be in that one you don't want to have you end up in an in-between space, right? This is, uh, Dave, you know Agamben better than I do, but you get into this this zone of you're neither, you neither belong here. And so, so basically, if you're fired from your state, which sounds funny, but if you're fired from your state and other states don't want you, where the fuck do you go? So this creates a real deadlock. Now, I, I think if, if you got them to be honest, I think Moldbug and Land would just be like, I'll kill them. I think that, I mean, or, or whatever, they don't care. Right. It's, because it's whatever he would just say, social Darwinism is reality. Deal yeah. With that's it. what he would do. Yeah. Land would do social Darwinism shit. Which is obviously going to be like probably what everyone's biggest problem with him is, is probably his, his sort of social. He's just like, Oh, that's just reality. You guys are just denying reality. It's if you just don't like evolution. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to say that, yeah, that's, I, I've always had this question. I know we got to close out here in a second, but I, I guess maybe in your closing statements there, there, Mikey, you could touch on it, but I'm just curious. Cause like, 
post-human, anti-human, transhuman. There's all these different positions. There's a lot of nuance that goes into the whole thing. I don't really understand it all. I can't map it um, in the contemporaneous discourse or whatever. Uh, but I mean, if we take the human to be this one thing and then say, coming out of Shanghai, you get like this, people are having chips in their brains and they're doing all these kind of like modifications and they're becoming more and more hive mindish like or whatever. It, there's still gonna be humans involved, but would he say, oh, it's already past the human at that point? Or does he actually think, no, nothing that's like, I guess, I'm, what does extinction really mean? How hard is the extinction? At the point that we're modified at a certain point, are we now not human to him? I, I, I've got these kinds of questions about it, but, but ultimately, like when you see like these these clips of like uh, children in school in China now, and they're they, they're wearing like these devices that scan their like they're they're blinking and like they're they, like every one of their movements or whatever, and like that there's there's uh there's AI reading like how much they're focusing and 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 it can tell if they're like having a mood that's off for the day or whatever, and like you know, like uh, some, some manager person is going to get alerted because this person's having an off day and they'll come check on them or whatever. Like this kind of psychopolitics being digitized, right? Like that, that's this cutting edge of, of the, the post-human, I think, I think to, to land, you know, it's, it's one of the things that he's so fascinated by and why he wants to be there on the ground researching this stuff. But, but I don't know. Yeah. My, my final question is basically just about like, Where's the line for him? Does he ever kind of get into at what point we would be extinct in his eyes? Um, yeah, that's the that's the thing that I've been thinking a lot about. So, look, as far as this this question of where do we cross the line from human to post-human, I don't know. That, I mean, that's that's a question I should have an answer to. But I guess I don't because I don't really recall him ever drawing a line in the sand and going – Here's what is human and here is what is inhuman or post-human. I mean, like if you have what, a million nanobots circulating through you, is at what point, what, how many nanobots do you have to have inside of you before you're not a human anymore? I think he would, I mean, I think he would say something like, look, this, this threshold is like a lot of thresholds where you know when it's been crossed, but you also don't know the exact moment so it's the sororities right uh sororities paradox or, or or the pile of sand so you have individual grains of sand you start putting one at a time on a table right well at what precise grain of sand does it pivot from being a bunch of individual grains of sand to being a pile of sand i don't know what particular grain of sand it is but at some point it transitions to being a pile of sand so um so, the, so the two things with I'm um, just a point of clarification with um, the dark enlightenment from Fang Newman. I'm kind of just I want to clarify for the listeners what that transition exactly is. Is it just that uh, during Fang Newman to dark enlightenment? Is it mainly just that he the position he changes his mind on is democracy, just like thinks democracy is the barrier to capital's expansion? Or is what other changes take place in that uh, transition to dark enlightenment? Sure. Well, basically, we have to think about because here's the thing: I I would argue there is no transition between the Fang Numina, the mature writings of Fang Meltdown, Machinic Desire, uh, Cyber Gothic, these key essays that he's known for. I think there's there's one transition period in Land's work, but it's earlier in earlier on. So from his early days, I mean, his first essays. Um, building up his his what he thinks of Kant, what he thinks of Bataille, what he thinks of Schopenhauer and Freud and Nietzsche, right? Uh, Bataille uh, into D and G, right? This whole early period, he is still championing this this what he calls the outside. This is why his Twitter handle is outsideness, which is to say, I haven't said it, I haven't connected these dots for you yet, and I should have, but capital and this techno future, these are fanged noumena for him. These are things that we don't have immediate experience of right now, but they ultimately are things outside of us that are having effects on us, and they're beyond our ability to fully comprehend them 
and in, it's in that sense that they're they're noumena because they're beyond our ability to fully intellectually or perceptually integrate them into our like i was saying we can't nobody can actually have a, a you know a concrete experience of the whole process of global capitalism like that is not an experience it, it's too gigantic it's 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 too infinite so to speak for anybody to just have a clear experience of it like i'm looking at a lamp right now right and so because these things are in a sense beyond us they're noumena for him they're fanged because they pose a threat to us and um so early on though he develops his his metaphysics or his key, core philosophy which he calls libidinal materialism and what he what this is essentially about is land seeing himself as the latest instance of a philosophical tradition that really starts with Schopenhauer where Schopenhauer he he was fundamentally influenced by Kant he accepted the distinction between appearances and things in themselves or phenomena and noumena but Schopenhauer also said yeah but this thing called noumena that Kant says we can't talk about it is something and I'm going to talk about it. it's called the will so he he has this vision of this metaphysical force called will that um, is behind all of our desire, and he 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 had lots of issues with it. So he wanted us to kind of do aesthetic practices to try to ward off the will. But the point is, with Schopenhauer, we get this distinction between the world as we experience it versus something outside of it that's imposing itself on us in everything we do. And so this goes up to Nietzsche and Bataille into D and G with their concept of desiring production or the machinic unconscious. And so here's the point in this early period where he's working out all this stuff, like he he's always on the side of us accelerating towards the, the fang noumena that's going to wipe us out. But early on, he thinks capital is on the side of the human security apparatus. He thinks capital is what is preventing us or prolonging the inevitable Whereas once he reads DNG, once he reads their interpretation of capitalism, especially in anti Oedipus, he realizes, at least for himself, that no, wait, I got it wrong. This whole, th th this outside, this radical realm of alien forces that is, has a will of its own, and that essentially we're going to find our day of judgment in, capital isn't what's preventing that capital is what's going to accelerate us towards that. And so this, this pivot really takes hold after he writes um, key, a key essay called circuitries. After that, from then on, capital is the fundamental agency that is accelerating towards noumenal future, which is to say judgment day where we're, we're annihilated or become extinct in some way, shape or form. Um, so I'll just say this uh, to, to wrap it up. So after he makes this uh, connection to the outside and to capital, so capital is what facilitates the acceleration of the outside. He stays there all the way up till now. So meltdown, all the stuff he did with CCRU, the dark enlightenment stuff, his books on China, his stuff on blockchain, all of it is still operating in this basic metaphysics of capital being the the thing that's taken us towards the uh the fang noumena and so that's that's the trajectory there yeah i just got one last question and i know we got to wrap it up very very soon but it's i think a very relevant question and that's because you know everyone likes to throw the thing the word fascist and, and conservative whatever but and uh, nick lands of course associated with neoconservatism uh, one of the things you mentioned in bringing up that quote with Marx and uh, the acceleration of uh, of capital and why favored free trade and it, the breakdowns of tradition. And it seems to me that Nick Land does not really give a shit about tradition. Uh, it's certainly if when he wants to, so, to accelerate capitalism, they obviously don't. Uh, but what is exactly conservative about neo uh, about um, neo reactionary ideology? Because he's associated associated with neo reaction. And reaction, of course, is associated with conservatism, and uh, to to an extent. And um, he, um, I, I also am just generally not clear what what is Nick Land's today, or I guess you could say, 
dark enlightenment to today position with regards to social conservatism because um i think social conservatism is something more that actually holds back capitalism as accelerationism more than uh, acceleration more than anything like even zizek actually in the defense of lost causes argues that um the reason why china brought back confucianism and is trying to push that really hard the confucian socialism is to kind of slow down and tame the capitalism that they had unleash under Deng Xiaoping. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. What is that role of conservatism in Nick sure. Land's whole theory? So, here's the thing. He is the great anti-conservative philosopher. He wants, a, he wants capital to essentially break down all races, all traditions, all identities. And so this is why he's anti-fascist. He doesn't want any particular people or anything to be preserved he wants all of that to be melted down so he, he and he, he this is where he's a deluso guitarian where the key revolutionary thing is to destroy 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 which is destroy tradition destroy traditional cultures tr destroy traditional identities and he's all for that so he's not a fascist be in the sense that he wants all this to be wiped out um if he, he he wouldn't even call himself a conservative, I don't think. What aligns him to the right is his anti-liberal uh, position. He, he's anti-liberalism. He's anti-human rights. Um, he's anti he's anti egalitarianism. He's anti human emancipation. And so he he's if you want to align him to the right, it's one because he's pro capitalist, and two because he's anti-liberal. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so um, I've I believe that's all you have time for now. Yeah, uh, but I, I have plenty of more questions to ask you. I, I could go on for longer, but uh, is there any last things that you forgot to uh, like mention with regards to Nick Land's theory, and of course things you want to plug to end the show? No, I just I would just say that the you know we're, what we're trying to do with the course is give this philosophical context. To understand what's going on in contemporary politics and also to understand what's going on in contemporary theory and philosophy also we we see in this despite our profound disagreements with land we see this uh this impulse to think the future to traffic with the future as ccru talks about as a that's a big influence on us and we think that we need to be trying to generate visions of future alternate futures um and i think that's a, a a key praxis that needs to be engaged with more so um yeah we'll we'll see what comes out of this yeah and i would just say uh folks it's coming up really fast because of the tour uh i was not focused on the promotions of the class and so here the class is going to be next week starting well actually this week so it's coming up on saturday october 28th and then it will continue november 4th 11th and 18th so it's saturdays at 5 p.m eastern time this is a different course than what we normally do a lot of the stuff we do is deep dive stuff like mikey's course for they don't know what they do it was 18 weeks it was nine lectures uh he went chapter by chapter it was very thorough this is going to be a lot more introductory and you're not even necessarily expected to have done the reading he is assuming an audience of people who didn't do it but might do it though of course we do have a handful of people who are crazy and will read everything and so there's like recommended readings every week and so um hope to see a couple people sign up because of this uh so you're welcome uh to join it, it will be available after the fact but it, it will be missing that live component so yeah, if you, if you don't have time to join it, you can always, if you, if you join it later, you can always get access to all the lectures, sort of what I'm doing with For They Know Not What They Do, right? Uh, as we uh, are still progressing through a, that extremely difficult book. Um, but yeah. it, the lectures have been quite helpful so far. So yeah, I highly recommend checking out. I highly recommend just, uh, you know, if you, I know people who are listening to this show probably have know of Dave and Theory Underground because We've talked before and I've been on the channel a few times, but um, I would, if you don't know uh, The Dangerous Maybe, I'd highly recommend it for like good introductions to theory. I think especially the the essays on Zizek, the articles on Zizek are very, very helpful, like Wage Labor and Jewish Sauce, probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, so yeah, if you guys enjoyed the show, I, I, also, I, I, 
in underground theory pick it up yeah of course of course yeah yeah if, if you guys enjoyed listening to this uh feel free to share it with a friend and give the pod a rating and check out the guys here and yeah peace out thanks, thanks for having us my only hope is that when enough people become pessimist then out of despair somebody maybe does something but you know why i also like to be a pessimist because it's the only way to have a nice life if you're an optimist then always bad things happen and you are always uh, disappointed when you are a pessimist then you look around okay there are bad but from time to time something nice happens and you are as a pessimist you are a little bit glad all the time no You are listening to One Dime Radio. Become a patron at patreon.com slash one dime to support the show and get access to extra content.